Okay, I'm going to talk about the Ombudsman. Ombudsman. Very, actually, quite funny when you listen to Jamie go through and talk about the Ombudsman. But Ombudsman? 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 It's very it's sexist, sexist, isn't it? It's an old um, I believe it's uh, from the Scandinavian yeah, land yeah. dialects. Yeah, uh, the yeah. yeah, it is. It's, um, it's interesting that, that people um, you know, in some area of law have some areas of the world have got a particular um, system or they've got a particular structure that's in place that other people look at and go, actually, that's all right. That's all right. We're just going to borrow that. And that's essentially what's happened here. The, um, the, the concept of the ombudsman is a relatively recent phenomena in, um, in sort of the English speaking in the common law world, but it's been around in the, um, in the Nordic and Northern European uh, countries for a little bit longer. Um, it's basically the, the theory is, oh, as soon as this pops up, that's a long one. The theory is that it's an independent body person who goes about examining and reviewing decisions and reviewing systems, making recommendations directly back to Parliament. And so that that's the, the real key uh, defining feature of the Ombudsman is that it's an independent body that reports directly to Parliament. It's funded directly through Parliament and reports directly to Parliament. And the idea is, in our system with a separation of powers, by <coughs> essentially bypassing all of government, that you can create a truly impartial uh, body or person um, to be able to go through and do things. So that's the the first sort of defining characteristics of the ombudsman. Uh, the second defining characteristic is that um, they report directly to Parliament that they have powers to review, to essentially bring things out to the world and show the world what's happening, but they don't have powers to do anything. That's this really this fundamental component of the ombudsman. So if there's, there's two things that you can learn now, and walk away, and literally walk out now if you really wanted to, it's that the, the ombudsman is about looking at things from an independent vantage point, reporting back directly to parliament, but they don't do anything. They don't have powers to make structural changes, to change decisions, just to bring them out to the world. Okay, I can't get the chat to work. I don't think too many people are going to be watching, but nonetheless, uh, you could just go through the learning objectives, which are slowly um, the structures that we have here. We're just going to go in the, this probably hour, hour and a half, might be too long. We're going to go and talk about the, the statutory framework that we've set up. It's still, even though they report to Parliament and they bypass government ministries in entirety, they still make decisions under an enactment. It's still part of a statutory framework um, and they're given some powers. And so these powers are generally investigative so they can go and go into government departments and do things and look at things. Um, and their other powers are to take information from citizens. The idea is that ombudsmen act as a system to essentially as a complaints mechanism and in situations where these complaints are popped up or on their own volition, they go and investigate stuff. So that's, that's really it. That's the ombudsman. Um, it's their structural role or their structural position in a, in a nutshell. And this is the sort of stuff that uh, you don't really get much in, in case law. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the citations here are going to be, um, uh, this is a, a secondary source, but the, uh, we'll be looking at just the statutory framework here because if you think about it the ombudsman what they do doesn't usually require much in the way of review it's their job to go and, and investigate things but they don't have powers to make substantive change and as such they don't really intersect much with the common law and the courts 
don't often have these things. I mean, they can be. In theory, you can go and seek reviews of the Ombudsman's decision, but if you, if you stop and think about that, you have to ask yourself, why? Why would you seek review of the Ombudsman when they only had the power to go and review and investigate anyway? Um, it seems a little bit um, fruitless. And so just make note that this area sort of sits alone in this subject because it's, um, it's another string in your bow, but it's kind of independent of the other things we've learned um, as part of this uh, subject. So this, this thing here, uh, self-initiated inquiries. One of the things about the Ombudsman is to just do with funding. Because they're funded directly from Parliament, they report directly to Parliament. Um, in a perfect world, we would have perfect separation of powers. The government would operate independent of the legislature, but that's not how things work in a Westminster system. It's the government of the day, in almost all situations, controls the majority of the seats in the lower house. And as such, they are the lawmakers. In Queensland, of course, we've only got one house. So we, uh, we are acutely aware that while the Ombudsman is independent, they're not, they're in, an independent body and separate to government, they're still responsive to parliament. And in our system, a place like Queensland, with no upper house and no substantive powers given to the nominal head of state, that really the government and the majority in parliament is going to be the same thing. So it sounds a little silly, but that's kind of just the, by the way our Westminster system works here. Oh, absolutely. So we're talking about independence. The, we could go through and make structural reforms. Queensland has, from time to time, as you're aware, had problems with essentially tyrannical governments, Joe Bjorki peterson style systems. And uh, I mean, I'm loath to say Campbell Newman um, because they did such a spectacularly bad job that they got kicked out after one term. Um, but you can have on command massive majorities in the House in Queensland and really be able to do things without much in terms of checks and balances. One of those things in theory you could do is defund the Ombudsman. Uh, and so really it's to do with the political aspects of this, making things visible, the Ombudsman going and issuing reports as part of this process. So it's an important part of our, our system of governance um, because it, it's, it's the classic example of an independently appointed position. Uh, these things do pop up. Um, other ones include things like the Reserve Bank. It's an independently created position. Yes, Parliament is supreme. Yes, Parliament could overturn this. Yes, Parliament could get rid of these things. But Parliament is responsive to the people. And so they do it. And in theory, if the people rebelled against it, they'd be turfed out a few years later. Okay, um, so essentially the ombudsman role is split into two, into two components. It's got this reactive part where complaints are fielded by members of the public uh, and the ombudsman follows them up. They follow them up and they also, as part of this process, can go and, and turn that into um, their own investigations to the proactive component. Uh, and they do have some funding to go and do investigations of their own volition. Um, and so these things are reflected in those particular statutes. So it'll have the, um, the aims and objects of the, uh, of the legislation. It, uh, it came comparatively early in this great administrative law um, shake-up of the mid to late 70s. And so the Ombudsman Office came in relatively early um, earlier than the FOI stuff we did last week. But it still formed part of what we call the, the zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a German word, means spirit of the times. In the 1970s, there was a demand really for a reform of the regulatory mechanisms in Australia. They needed a big shake up. And I, I've mentioned this in the past that the um, administrative law was at one, one of the big arms of this. The AAT was brought in. The ADJR was brought in. Um, the FOI stuff came a little bit later in the early 80s. And the Ombudsman 
arrived at the same time as well. Um, that great change, time of change in the Australian legal system. It's actually interesting, you guys uh, are probably aware of this as law students, that uh, another change um, occurred about this time to do with legislative drafting. And so we have the benefit of these pieces of legislation actually being quite readable. It, whereas if you go back to legislation crafted not that much earlier, the words used are a little bit trickier and harder to follow. Um, so that, uh, for example, the Property Law Act, which is sort of similar in the era, but when you go through and read it, it's a little bit trickier. The language uses is a little bit more complex and archaic. Um, and certainly if you go further back, things like the Old Tax Act, they're, um, they're horrible things to read. And so this period is where Parliament decided to really move towards this plain English method of drafting. All right. Um, and so these two, I guess two limbs of it is the reactive and the proactive. They're, they're two arms of what it does. It takes complaints, goes and investigates them. And in some situations when information has come to them or they've discovered something or there's a report that's, that's been made, they can go and make investigations of their own volition. So that's the, these are the two arms of the ombudsman role. Now, we think of the ombudsman as one person, but it's actually lots of them. Um, now, you also have to note here that these are the Commonwealth ones. So these are the areas that you can go and have an issue complaints towards. And look, it's something to note for you guys in practice. It's a very easy to, option. It's low-hanging fruit. When somebody comes in and has a complaint about one of these areas, if you think about it, delving straight into merits review or even worse, judicial review in regards to a decision, is that's a lot of work. And while I'm not encouraging you to try and be lazy, as lazy as possible, these bodies, from an investigative um, perspective, the, the ombudsman can go and has the expertise to investigate things that have happened. But you need to know in the back of your mind, when your client is sitting there, the ombudsman can't do anything. They can report and review on it, make recommendations, but they, can't, they don't have any substantive powers to go and um, you know, issue writs or to remake decisions. They can refer things, I'll get to that a little bit, but they, they can't actually go and do things themselves. They can refer things to other bodies, but they can't do things themselves. And so that is, um, it's an important thing to note when you're there advising your clients about the different avenues that they have. If they need something to happen, the ombudsman is not going to do that. Um, note that these areas here are all government related. These are government related roles, like government decision making. Um, uh, they involve government decisions for most of these, uh, with the possible exception of the uh, last one. Don't get me wrong, they, they certainly intersect with private bodies, um, private um, uh, education providers, for example, um, private courier companies, um, although the top two. Know, in theory, you might have a complaint about Thales or someone like that, but uh, imagine that that doesn't come up much. But So the top two are generally solely the domain of government, whereas the rest of them can be a mix of the two. You can complain about private um, bodies to the federal ombudsman area. Now, there are, however, for specific industries, um, things that are, uh, that, can, that are often funded by particular industries. And it's, it's a curious feature of Australia, by the way, and I've really noticed this as a Kiwi. I have a, a business degree, and business background, and interest in politics, and really noticing some of the, not just the cultural differences between the two countries, but a lot of the structural differences. Here, Australians are either, either more comfortable with or more used to having large 
institutional players essentially dominate certain inju- um, industries. Um, oligopoly is the, uh, is the technical term. So that you've got a small number of players in these large businesses, your banks, your insurance companies, your supermarkets. And the way that it seems to work here is that government for the, for the most part lets them go and do their things and makes their profits but seeks to regulate them by putting some pretty strong uh, consumer mechanisms over the top. Don't get me wrong, these industries push back. Your banks are particularly powerful. Um, Your mining industry is very powerful in terms of pushing back. But you will note that these things here generally are a bunch of the large players. One of the ways that they get, are able to maintain the status quo is that they fund these sorts of um, regulatory mechanisms. And rather than coming directly from the taxpayer's pocket, we let these big players do their thing, but we fund bodies that help regulate them. And one of the important bodies to regulate them is the relevant ombudsman for that industry. Um, they've got different names to if you can see it'll be like mediation advisor um airline customer or is it customer or is it consumer no it's customer advocate they act in very similar ways to each other they're set up by the relevant um industry usually at the request of the relevant industry and or parliament now why would you as an industry want to do this Well, again, it goes back to that idea that industries that are large and make a decent amount of profit from having a small number of players don't want to be regulated. The more regulation, the more oversight, the more the public can see what's happening, the less money they're going to make. That's a fact. And so it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act with any intersection between government and private sector bodies and industries because we want and want to encourage the private sector because they're the ones that truly add growth, add value to the economy. Government can't. It's just not, the incentives are not in alignment. Private bodies are incentivized to maximize profits by being as efficient as possible. Government, in theory, is about maintaining the well-being and good governance of citizenry. These two things are not in alignment. And so this urge to regulate that comes from government and comes from parliament is usually met with resistance in the relevant industry. So what happens is that there's often an overt, sometimes covert, but you generally overt threat if you don't regulate yourselves, we will do it for you. And if we, as the government, are gonna go and regulate these industries, we're gonna do so with a, a broadsword, not a scalpel. And so that it's, it becomes something of a balancing act. The industries don't want to be regulated, but they know if they don't do it themselves, if they misbehave, for want of a better word, the parliament is going to jump in and smack them down and create much harsher rules and regulations, which again, aren't in their best interest. The harder the regulations, the bigger the fines, the more compliance cost that's placed on industry, the less profit they make. So that's a difficult um, uh, balancing act between the political needs to regulate these things, because at the end of the day, we also want these things We want these things regulated for the betterment of society. We want consumers to not be hurt. We want um, the Australian economy to thrive. And we want all of the public and private benefits that all of these industries provide to the general public. Things that are not best done by government directly. And so that's this tricky balancing act that they have. One of them, again, is to get the funding from industry, begrudgingly, to set up these offices who will then go and investigate the industry. 
One of the, well, the side effects of this is that it, it makes it difficult for new players to enter. And so it almost forms this cycle because it's hard, particularly for smaller um, infrastructure providers, small electricity, telco providers to enter into these markets where they're already dominated by large players. And there's a lot of uh, oversight as well um, because it, the barriers to entry, the dollars you have to spend to get in, are much, much higher. Sorry about the, um, the um, political economy uh, component, but it's, I think it's useful to know because knowing why and how these things have come, have come about, I think it's really useful. Okay, that's the Commonwealth Framework. These are the Queensland ones. Um, and the, again, there are lots of, of areas of our lives that are regulated. Um, dri driver's license in motor vehicles, um, about uh, child protection, charges, levies, benefits, and so on. Um, just note that um, we're aware that Section 51 of the Australian Constitution divvies up the powers of the federal government and leaves the rest to the states. But we also know that in practice, the federal government has far more cash. Uh, for those that have studied constitutional law, by now you would have learned about the income tax cases from the 1940s onwards. The federal government took the income tax during the Second World War and never gave it back. So the states have been broke, essentially, ever since. As such, there is a shift towards the funding for hospitals and schools coming from the federal government, even if, strictly speaking, they're the realms of the states themselves. So the hospitals have their own statutory frameworks, and the um, you know, Junction of University, for example, that's certainly a Queensland Act. Um, but what that means is that you have a state-based um, ombudsman for some areas and a Commonwealth one as well. All right, so some practical mechanisms here. The ombudsman role, like many of these independent commissions that we have, we want to give them tenure. Now you guys would have been exposed to this when you studied LA 1101 uh, in the context of judges. Judges are very hard to remove from office. So are ombudsmen. So are a certain other types of commissioners as well. Um, Julian Triggs was the human rights commissioner and I believe it was Tony Abbott and her had a very very large, very unpleasant, very public spat about stuff. And one of the th things he threatened to do was to remove her tenure. Um, that created a lot of political backlash. Because in theory, Parliament can do anything. They are supreme. They can go and remove the... Um, they can go and remove these from, uh, from office. Why? Because they can simply repeal the relevant sections in the Act. Parliament can't remove judges without following the rules and principles enshrined in the Australian Constitution. So these independent commissions are still subject to tyrannical governments because tyrannical governments in a state like Queensland where there's no house of review can pass whatever legislation they like you know, and they can pass legislation that removes or changes or just um, uh, yeah, could either remove entirely the office of the ombudsman or remove a particular person. So while they are appointed and there is this very formal aspect of tenure um, you always leave in the back of your mind, this is an ordinary act of parliament. An ordinary act of parliament is subject, in theory, to change. Okay, so, but the structure that we have here is that it's appointed um, uh, by the Governor General. Uh, the, sorry, the Governor, this is the, um, the Federal well, Ombudsman Act, so that's uh, here we're talking about the Governor General. And uh, given tenure, 
and they are hard to remove without changing the act itself. So does this look very familiar? Is that subsection one? What this is, uh, section tw uh, 29 of the act. Looks very similar to the removal of judges, doesn't it? Really, really, very similar language. And that's by design. We want to set these things up. We want to make them as independent as we possibly can. Uh, but you have to leave on the back of your mind, as law students, this is an ordinary act of parliament. It looks and smells and operates like the Constitution does, but it's not the Constitution. And so if somebody asks you the question, how do you remove the Ombudsman? Yes, you can point to Section 28 and say it's, this is the, the process. But you know in the back of your mind, if the Ombudsman is to be removed, Parliament could just take this act and repeal it, and replace it with one that's exactly the same. Um, interesting that leave of absence part though, and notice that it's a seven capital A. I'm not too sure the circumstances that that came about. But note that the Ombudsman, from a practical perspective, are actually given a lot of discretion to go through and um, do things. They, <laughs> they don't have a lot of oversight from government because they can't. They report directly back to Parliament. So that's, their, that's their role, is to be independent. Essentially be the watchdog of the government of the day. Okay, so jurisdiction. What can they do? Um, they're given powers to investigate things, bodies that are exercising powers uh, of a public nature. So that does include private bodies that are doing public functions. If you are a contractor, moving prisoners around the various compounds on Manus Island. That's going to be decisions that are of a public nature, even if they're performed um, uh, by private bodies. Um, just note here, I've, I've put NGOs. Usually we use NGOs to refer to non um, not-for-profits, but that includes both private profit-making and non-government um, charitable type organisations, charitable or political or religious organisations. All right, so what can they not do? What they can't do is interfere with the political process. That's the really key part of this. Ombudsman does not go and look into the diaries of cabinet. Um, it doesn't investigate ministerial decisions. Those are decisions made fundamentally of a political nature. Um, there are some, uh, some things as well that are considered sacred. Um, employment stuff. Employment stuff is always a little bit tricky in terms of public law because employment itself is such an inherently private, um, personal uh, function or attribute of us. And you have to stop and think about that, why that is, why we can't usually get judicial review or merits review of employment related decisions because everyone would do it. You got 700 people applying for one job, 699 people would want to seek review. And that would make the entire system grind to a halt. So employment decisions are usually, usually retain some um, aspect of independence from these sorts of investigative functions. 
Um, okay, and that's the, both of the last uh, appointments under the um, under the APS legislation. Oh, another quite important thing to note: the ombudsman can't investigate his decision of decisions of the court. So decisions of ministers and decisions of the court fall outside the scope of what the ombudsman, you know, the office of the ombudsman is really set up to try and achieve. Judges making a decision is just completely independent of the ombudsman. All right, so what do they get? The ombudsman have a bunch of powers. Now you may or may not have known, is anybody here studied tax? Tax law, going to next year? Some of you are, that's good. Um, we used to have two tax subjects and the second one we would go and talk about the, um, the powers of the commissioner. You would be amazed at how much power the tax office have, vastly more power than the federal police to go and grab things, documents, and make people turn up. Um, similarly, the ombudsman's power to investigate, they are strong. They've got powers to go through seize information, and I've got a wall of text up there. Um, in this bit here where they have reason to believe that a person is capable of furnishing information that's required, um, they can actually demand that they attend and perform and produce those documents. Um, these are not powers that are given lightly. And then similarly, not powers, importantly here, that require them to go and ask the court. Now you, again, you guys should be at least vaguely aware of the powers of police. The police want to get certain documents. They have to get um, obtain a certain instrument. What's the instrument called? Warrant. And usually they have to be signed off by um, either a magistrate or in some situations a, a JP. I think it's sign off some warrants. Different types, but the, the idea is that it has to have an independent person to verify the correctness of this before it happens. Uh, the Ombudsman um, and the Tax Office as well have these powers to go through and investigate and get documents that don't require it to be signed off by a court. They have, can you hear what's the phrase that we start with? Reason suspicion? where the ombudsman has reason to believe a person is capable um, of producing documents or other records relevant to an investigation under the Act. Once they start an investigation, the powers they have to investigate are wide. They're wide and they don't have judicial oversight. Um, so just, just bear that one in the back of your mind. But that's okay because the ombudsman can't do anything with that information. They can use it, analyze it, and report on it, but they can't use it. It can't be used in a variety of mechanisms. Sorry, that's something like a wall of text. What can they do once they've got the documents? Oh, they can do things like make copies of it, hold on to it. Um, there was a change there as well. Um, oh, and give the person, oh, this is one down here. Yeah, you can also, if, if you think about it in terms of documents, um, in this day and age, generally we can just take things and scan them. And so we don't have this need to physically go have the documents and hold on to them in most situations. In most situations, the office can come along and just make copies. Um, you, you used to hear stories about um, the auditors are coming or the tax office is coming and you get, you get staff standing next to shredders, just shredding things, burning stuff. Um, these days, it's a little bit, um, a bit more mainstream, particularly with government departments where they obliged to keep records in an electronic format. And so that some of these things in terms of the physical holding of, of documents, it's not quite so relevant in, in this day and age. Um, 
Okay. And uh, this part down here, uh, what is it, section 9, subsection 2. Where the Ombudsman has reason to believe a person is able to give information relevant to investigation by notice in writing served on that person, require them to attend uh, before the person specified, in other words, the person the Ombudsman is nominated, such date and times as are specified in the notice to answer questions relevant to the investigation. Does that involve any court, judicial officer? No. Um, this is rare, by the way. This is actually a relatively rare set of powers, even if it's the first of these that you guys have gone through and been exposed to. All right. Oh, wall of text. I apologise for that. I've got a good result here. Probably put too much on the uh, on the fly. Ah. This is the exemption part. So the the <laughs> the Attorney General here, uh, here. This is under the federal system. So the federal Attorney General um, can go and say that certain types of matter is off limits. Things involving national security, intelligence, and such like. Um, and again, this is also the position where in situations that involve disclosure by ministers, and ministerial decision making, the Attorney General can essentially go and stamp documents or produce a certificate that says these documents are done either in relation to national security and defence or in regards to ministerial um, disclosure. They can go and preclude the Ombudsman from, from entering in to, um, to investigate so some particular part. Um, also, the, um, where we've got this one down, the Integrity Commissioner. Uh, this is quite similar to the, um, uh, the Information Commissioner. Uh, they're different words. They sound kind of similar, but they're, they're separate bodies. Uh, and that there is there is a tendency for governments to try and create anti-corruption sort of watchdogs, so JC in Queensland and the um, so there's integrity um, commissioners in the federal system where they they are set up and independent, designed to essentially try and weed out corruption. That's their job to go through and do things, and so they have given investigative powers as well to go through government to look at stuff, and. In some situations, they're going to be given documents and then determine whether or not they can be, um, ought to be released to other sort of departments, FOI and so on like that. So it's a bit like the, um, the information commissioner. They go through and look at these things. And so that they can, in some situations, issue a, um, uh, a notice here to say, these particular um, documents are going to prejudice um, like the life and health and safety of certain people. Or they um, endanger the life of a person or create a risk of serious injury to a person. Um, they can go through and, and, um, and to essentially act as a shield or to thwart the Ombudsman's in op uh, powers to investigate. Okay. Oh, civil actions. Oh, yeah, there's immunity. That's right. So when the Ombudsman comes and uh, first of all, if you make a complaint to the Ombudsman, you are protected civilly. All right. Assuming that it's been done, it hasn't been done maliciously, you've not acted in good faith by contacting the Ombudsman and an investigation is made, you can't be sued for that. There's a federal, blanket federal protection from doing that. And... When you are being invest, when there is an investigation, you are summoned to actually go and furnish such information. The furnishing of that information cannot cause any um, civil action to arise. In other words, you have a defence under the section. It's a bit like um, uh, the powers of the court. When you are going and adducing evidence in court, you're protected. You have immunity in terms of doing that. 
So, we've only got about 10 minutes more to go, so we're going to finish this task quite a bit early. Uh, I've mentioned before that the Ombudsman does not have the power to do things. They don't have any mechanism to issue fines. They don't have any mechanism to award damages, or costs order, or to take out injunctions. They have nothing of that type of power. Their primary role is to investigate and report. Um, and part of this reporting function is the referral function. They can refer a matter to the minister, they can refer a matter to the relevant administrative decision maker in an, in an appropriate government department. They can refer questions involving issues of fact to the AAT and questions involving issues of law to the federal court. So they have these referral powers. So while they can refer these questions, they don't have the power to actually bring actions. It's a really important limit to their power. Ombudsmen are not there to do things. Lovely typo on my slide. Breach of a guilty. What am I saying? Uh, breach of a statutory duty. Misconduct. Or a criminal breach. That can be referred to the relevant minister. And so that, that's it. And I think that well encapsulates the limits to their powers. They can't punish. They can't award dollars. They can only refer matters to, to relevant decision makers, the ministers, questions of fact to the AT, questions of law to the um, federal court. And their other principal role, which is the final slide, final slide of all of the content for the subject, actually, that may, f may or may not fill you all with joy, I'm not sure, is the idea of reporting. So that the Ombudsman's role is to be appointed directly by Parliament, be funded directly from Parliament, and report directly to Parliament. So it's given to the Minister, uh, might be the Attorney General, I'm not sure who the relevant Minister is actually, but I know, actually, I think it's given to the Speaker of the House. I think it's, it's directly given to the Speaker, from memory. And the Ombudsman's report is read out to Parliament to, after it has gone and done an investigation. So it can do these things uh, whether, whether it's asked to. Um, it has to do them periodically, I believe twice yearly. It has to report back as of um, duty, statute says so. And if there is a particular or special matter that's either been referred to by Parliament or the Ombudsman has done of their own volition, that's a special report. That will be go and tabled to Parliament after the results are done. And so that is fundamentally what this person does. That is the role of that office. It is not coercive. It is investigative. It gets very strong powers to investigate. Notice that the, um, the list of mechanisms in the FOI regime, there are lots of different heads of reasons to not give information under freedom of information. There are very few heads to refuse information under uh, in regards to the Ombudsman investigating. So the Ombudsman has much more power than the citizen to go and get things from government departments. But they can't do anything with it. <laughs>
Also note that the Ombudsman fields complaints from the citizen, but they're not representing them. They're not working for you. Nope. They're independent. They're doing things for themselves. So they may, and usually will, follow up a complaint of a legitimate nature, but they're not obliged to. And if they do go and investigate it, they may go off and investigate things further because they've seen some other problem in regards to this. They act of their own volition. Nonetheless, the catalyst is the citizen. People going, calling them up, having problems. And this acts as a good source of data for government decision making because if the ombudsman is tabling these reports, showing all of these data, this, uh, all of this data back to the um, back to Parliament, it becomes political. Parliament is open. Parliament doesn't sit in private. And their records are public to everyone. Everyone can go and see them. I do have some exceedingly boring friends who will actually have Parliament um, discussing bills on the, in the background while they're having morning tea or breakfast at, at home. Um, I'm not sure whether or not they have that equivalent parliamentary TV in Queensland, I'm not sure. They do in New Zealand. So that, in terms of content, is the end. So what we're going to do, um, starting the next week, we're going to finish, finish a little early today. We're going to go, uh, the tutor will be at the normal time, only because others will turn up. We'll go and start talking about the exam. And I'll, I'll um, basically just be going through for everyone's information, just do live streams as per normal, starting next week. I'm talking about the exam stuff to really get you guys prepped and ready to go. But uh, I hope the content was for the subject was useful. I hope that you learned stuff and that there are some things that you can take away. And look, admin law is one of those areas that most of you won't practice in this. Some of you might but most of you won't. It's only a minority of practitioners that um, with us. But what you might find is that for those that aren't in legal practice, you'll be involved in statutory frameworks. And certainly the cheap for this week, when I'm talking about the Townsville Council Dog Act and so on like that, the interpreting of statutory frameworks is a really big part of administrative law. And you guys, I hope, are now armed with more information um, to know how and why these things are structured and to have multiple angles of attack, knowing about the Ombudsman, knowing about freedom of information, knowing about merits review, and largely knowing about judicial review in regards to administrative law, I think is a very useful set of skills to know. Even if you have to go and dust off your old notes, dust them off to, and refresh yourself as to how this thing works mechanically. Uh, so I, I hope it's useful. I find this area of law quite interesting, quite useful. I, um, this is probably the last time I'm going to teach it, but uh, I, um, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys smash this exam. So uh, I'll turn the stream off, and um, I'll see everybody in the, in the tube.